Here's a hot take narrative for you. In 1960, the short-sighted British colonial government ruling Hong Kong made a devil's deal with the infinitely patient Chinese communists. The Chinese roped the colonial government into its grasp with the now fateful 1960 water supply deal. In this 1960 deal, Hong Kong, which had once been fully water independent, now takes water from China's East River, called the Dongzhang. 20 years later, this plan set in place by the Chinese was exercised during negotiations between the British and the Chinese. Uh, the British were forced to accept the one country, two systems policy, and years later, even to this day, the Chinese used the water supply threat to keep the Hong Kong government under its thumb and to suppress potential Hong Kong independence movements. Thus, the Chinese Communist Party, ultra-patient snakes in the grass with infinite strategic wisdom, and the United Kingdom, and thus democracy, short-sighted idiots who cannot think anything more than two years ahead of themselves. In this video, we're going to take apart this narrative, which makes it seem like Hong Kong blundered into a situation that it could have controlled, and at the same time gives the communists much more of an aura, quote-unquote, that they should be credited with. What actually happened is, as always, much more complicated. So let's get back at the beginning. The British received control of Hong Kong Island from the Qing Dynasty in 1842 at the end of the First Opium War. Uh, it expanded those territories with the Kolon Peninsula after the Second Opium War in 1860 and then finally in 1898 with the 99 year lease of the new territories seen green above. Uh, the area gets a lot of rain, about 2,225 uh, 2, milliliters. Uh, millimeters. Uh, but it comes at a very specific time, mostly uh, during the spring and the summer. And since there's not a lot of land in Hong Kong, storing all that water in the autumn and winter is difficult. Hong Kong sits on solid granite, so all that water flows to the sea and does not collect into underground reservoirs. So you can't drill, you can't do really anything for that. Uh, for the British, Hong Kong represented a gateway to the Chinese market and was an important military base. The Qing Dynasty and the Republic of China, which succeeded it, were not super excited about the British being around at their borders all the time, but they sort of dealt with it, though it seemed like Chiang Kai-shek had started thinking about reasserting Chinese sovereignty over Hong Kong near the end of World War II. I think there's an intriguing discussion to be had about the future of China if the Kuomintang had won the Civil War. Um, the two parties seemed quite similar. Uh, they had little means, though, anyway, both the Qing and the Republic of China of pushing the British around, though. Uh, but this all changed at the conclusion of World War II and the establishment of the People's Republic of China in October 1949. The same month, the Communists marched the Mar Army right up to the Hong Kong Chinese border. And the British, still reeling from World War II, were in absolutely no position to stop them. Hong Kong in its current status is exists for absolutely no other reason other than that the CPC decided not to invade that month and the months afterwards. And since then, and with the burgeoning civil Cold War, the British realized that Hong Kong was uh, poised at the edge of a volcano, quote-unquote. The colonial government uh, adjusted to signal to the Chinese government a form of cooperation in dealing with the Chinese refugees that come in and managing the city-state's internal orders. Uh, so why didn't China march in and take over? Uh, we don't really know really, but it seems to be for two big reasons. Uh, during the Korean War, uh, they were able to access goods for their army despite a massive embargo, and that was only done through Hong Kong itself. So, um, in addition, the Chinese saw Hong Kong has a window to the rest of the world, especially after the Sino-Soviet split cut them off from Soviet technology and financial aid. The tacit deal then was struck is that if the British do not harm Chinese interests, the Chinese do not invade. Um, that's the best theory. Um, yeah, so that, that that's what I that's the what I could find. Um, for a long time, though, the population of Hong Kong had been dependent on a number of reservoirs built within the territory, but the population had started to explode with the event advent of World War II, the Chinese Civil War, and a massive famine in 1958 to 61, which sent a huge number of um, refugees over the border hundreds of thousands, and the infrastructure was struggling to keep up with all that growth. And you can see like they've been building all these particular reservoirs, but none of them are very, very large at all. Uh, and then by the end of the 1950s, the water supply situation made it such that the colony was vulnerable to any disruption, which is sort of exactly what happened. There was a drought in the spring of 1959 that hit the colony's ability to meet the population's needs. It was then that Hong Kongers within the pro-Chinese circle suggested to the governor, Sir Robert Black, within, that the Guangdong government 
uh, might be able to channel water to Hong Kong in addition to providing for its own local needs. They were building the reservoir uh, in Guangdong anyway, so why not help out Hong Kong? Uh, and to be honest, the Guangdong government itself was probably not all that excited or charitable. Um, they they particularly they they had to be they had to be ordered into negotiations by uh, Zhou Enlai. Uh, so the official offer was extended in January 1960, and it was offered with no duress, no pressure. The British could say no, yes, no, take it or leave it. Uh, so Black was an experienced governor. He had previously been the governor of Singapore as well, and he was more than aware of the risks. Um, most Hong Kongers did not trust the communists for good reason, and did not want to be potentially held hostage by Chinese water supplies being turned off again for good reason. But Black also needed to provide for his people, and since political stability was the utmost concern for his administration, he judged that tapping Chinese supply would be the fastest way to do that. So in the end, after consultation with the government back home in Britain, he decided that he would strike the agreement and he would agree to it. But in the end, at the same time, he would develop independent water supplies to help prevent the Chinese from strangling them. So he also structured the deal in such a way to, make, to reduce the propaganda hit. He refused to take the water free of charge and insisted on a reasonable price to avoid the PR. And at the same time, the water agreement was decided by low-level officials and not in the name of the, of the main government itself. This way, the Chinese would not be able to see this as something that officially guided their policy, nor could they be used for propaganda. And at the same time, they publicized the water agreement through press releases, again so to co-opt the impact of the, proper of the potential propaganda. So the water began to flow, and Black immediately then started building out independent water supplies. But things were getting worse drought-wise. Um, in 1962, Hong Kong had one of its worst droughts in history. For two years, Hong Kong received less than half of the amount of rain it usually got, and the drought hit everyone in that South China region, and China could not provide any more water to Hong Kong. They had to restrict, uh, impose water restrictions, and they did that all the way up until May 1964. And as the decade rolled into the 1960s and ending rolling into 1967, these restrictions became incredibly damaging politically. Uh, riots would happen as leftists spurred on by the Cultural Revolution over the border would call any of these water restrictions quote-unquote a dirty political scheme aimed at suppressing the glorious struggle against British prosecution. Uh, persecution. Uh, the government would have to suppress nearly 200 riots that sprung up for these and other political reasons and they arrested 5,000 people. This led to a lot of strain between them and the, and the mainland. Um, there were situations where it was felt that they would kind of exercise that uh, that, that water card. Uh, so with that in mind, the British worked extra hard to build out additional reservoirs and other independent water supplies. They completed uh, Plover Cove uh, nine years in nine years after the the, the deal was signed uh, in 1968, and it held three times the amount of water as all the other reservoirs in the colony previously. The government estimated actually that with this reservoir they would be able to supply water right into the early 70s without any need from any need from China. They built two more reservoirs, uh, High Island Reservoir and Look on Pai, which I think is more of a desal plant. And they also explored more, you know, kind of outlandish schemes such as desalination powered by nuclear energy, which did not get developed. Um, in addition, Hong Kong created new systems by which it could use seawater to flush its toilets which conserved fresh water only for those who needed it. Uh, so by 1979, it was determined that China would only need to supply some 27% of Hong Kong's water supply, which actually kind of made it pretty independent. Daily supply without Chinese help could be provided by Plover Cove alone, uh, except that there are two huge caveats. The first caveat was that the costs spent were immense. Plover Cove cost Hong Kong $541 million Hong Kong dollars, which was nearly a fourth of the colony's total spending in 1968 to 69, add to it to the other reservoirs such as, you know, High Island, which cost about, you know, 30% of the annual budget, and Lokong Pai desalinization plant, as well as again the operational cost of running the reservoirs. And now you got some serious budget problems. Remember, the government also has to provide education law and order, medicine, public housing, as compared to building something like Plover Cove, which required people to literally dam the ocean and fill it with rainwater, building a pipeline to channel river water from China to Hong Kong seems so much cheaper. 
And then China began opening up. Their opening up policy in um, 1979 greatly improved relations on the border. Fiscal critics had began blasting the colonial government. Why on earth are they wasting so much money? The Waterworks Department had ran a 28 million Hong Kong dollar deficit due to the fuel costs of desalinization in 1981-82 when you can get cheap water from a now friendly China. Uh, and the second caveat matters much, much more. It has to do with the locations of the reservoirs. All those local reservoirs serving Hong Kong, which included Plover Cove and High Island, were located in the new territories. And if you recall, the British leased them from China for only nine, nine years. Uh, those years would be up in 1997 and would not be renewed. So 99% of all the local water capacity was located within the new territories and once reclaimed by the Chinese, the water supply card could be exercised at will. So in 1979, when the first negotiation of the handover began, the colonial government had did significantly depend on Chinese water, but had also built significant countermeasures to deal with it. But once it became clear that the new territories would be reclaimed, the rest of Hong Kong had to go. And after the declaration was signed, there was no real need to build independent water supplies, right? Thus, you know, Hong Kong water supply started to become consumed by China. The joint declaration was signed in 1984, and a year later, China supplied over 50% of Hong Kong water consumption. Six years later, that was 80%, and now the Dongjiang now uh, dominates the Hong Kong water supply. It's a core point of any Chinese official regarding Hong Kong independence that China exercises massive control over the issue through, you know, food and water. Um, and the funny thing, though, is that Hong Kong being part of China now is that Shenzhen and Guangdong, the Guangdong area, are now so large, those areas need their own water too. And Hong Kong is no longer privileged to receive cheap water from the Dongchang, and they again have to start investing in building out their own water supplies. So the crucial error, uh, if you want to call it that, if there anything, was that the border between Hong Kong and China was a political one and not a geographical one. It's not a mountain range and not an ocean, so it did not brook much protection from any potential occupation. Hong Kong's geography and rapid urbanization meant that it did not have any land for storing its own water or growing its own food. China needed British Hong Kong at the time to negotiate with the outside world for 150 years, but soon after its opening up, that need ended, and with that, Hong Kong could not be independent. <laughs>